Okay, good morning, everyone. We will start the BlockFi, uh, I guess, BlockFi calendar this morning. Those are the only matters I have on. Uh, we are hearing the matter remotely, so the usual rules apply. If you wish to be heard, please raise your hand, and I will do my best to spot you and uh, hear from you. Uh, my understanding is the pending motion uh, to intervene has been resolved. Uh, the JPL's uh, motion to intervene, I believe an order, a proposed order was sent. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Bernard, I see your hand raised. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Richard Bernard, a favorite drinker on behalf of uh, the Joint Provisional Liquidators. Yes, yesterday afternoon, uh, towards the end of the day, um, we came to agreement on the form of order with the U.S. government. Uh, it's been circulated. I don't think the committee has any issue with it. And I know the debtor signed off on a prior version uh, of that form of order. Um, and we've submitted it informally to Your Honor through your chamber's email, but we, we understand that there's a more formal process to submit uh, an agreed order. All right. Uh, Ms. Dworskin, did you want to be heard? Yes, Thank Your you, Honor. Mr. Bernard. Sharon Dwoskin. Sharon Dwoskin from Brown Dog Next for the committee. We have no objection to the JPL intervention and no comments to the order that was that was circulated to us and that will, will be submitted. That's fine. So uh, I'm happy to look at the order and uh, if there are any concerns, I assume uh, parties will reach out for uh, uh, for for the court. Uh, that leaves us with, I believe, uh, two matters that are contested. Uh, the motion by the lead plaintiff or proposed lead plaintiff, Cameron Wyatt, uh, to re revise the prior orders of the court with respect to the proposed class action matter uh, and the contested motion to stay the adversary proceeding with uh, the United States uh, pending uh, a determination of the motion to withdraw the reference. Uh, Ms. Chavez, let me hear from you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Jordan Chavez, along with Amy Furness of Haynes and Boone, on behalf of the Block Five debtors. Good morning. Uh, I good morning. I agree with you, Your Honor. Those are the only two remaining matters set on the agenda. If it's okay with Your Honor, before we take up those matters, I would like to just take a moment to briefly address the data privacy issue that arose over the last few days. I think that'd be appropriate. Thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. We were notified by Kroll that through a SIM swapping attack on an employee's mobile phone, they fell victim to a data breach resulting in a leak of personal information of the Block 5 creditors, including the name, address, and emails and phone numbers, the type of information that Block 5 would have provided to Kroll for the creditor matrix and for servicing purposes. Uh, Kroll is still conducting a more thorough investigation, but Block 5 took immediate action along with coordinating with the committee and Kroll to provide the relevant communications to the affected parties, along with uh, discussions with the U.S. trustee and the relevant regulatory and government authorities. I did just want to confirm on the record that BlockFi was not the subject of the attack and that its system is still secure. All right. That's good to hear. Uh, it's frightening that... Uh, uh, this information is so readily available through such uh, what would seem uh, facile ways of getting uh, of accessing it through a telephone. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's alarming in so many respects. But I'm glad that the debtor um, and all the debtors that are involved in these cases uh, uh, are taking the proper steps. Does anybody else Thank you. wish to comment on it? All right. Uh, let me turn to debtors' counsel. Is there a preference for which matter to be heard first? Yes, Your Honor. I think we would propose taking up the green adversary first, which will be handled from our end by Ms. Burnett. All right. Thank you. Uh, then let me turn to... Uh, Let me have appearances on the green on this matter. 
Your Honor, uh, Michael Etkin, Lowenstein Sandler, uh, on behalf of the proposed uh, lead plaintiff, Mr. Wyatt, and uh, uh, with me as my colleague, Michael Papandrea, um, as well as Brian Calandra, uh, who is uh, proposed lead counsel in connection with the class action representing Mr. Wyatt. All right. It is your motion. Why don't you proceed then? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, uh, just a, uh, a couple of observations uh, at the outset. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we are requesting extremely narrow relief uh, from the existing injunction that was entered back in April. Um, we simply want the district court or courts to be able to rule uh, with respect to the pending uh, lead plaintiff motions and issue an order uh, with respect to those motions. Um, there have been no objections by the uh, counsel uh, on behalf of the plaintiffs uh, that executed the stipulation. Uh, we know that Mr. Green has advised, Mr. Green's counsel has advised us, uh, that they, uh, support the motion that's, uh, uh, that's before Your Honor today. Uh, in addition, we have not seen any objection by the, uh, creditors committee. Uh, with respect to the individual defendants, um, who are the beneficiaries of the injunction, and have been referenced by counsel for the debtors, uh, there's been no objection filed by them. And in fact, uh, it's worthy of note that uh, uh, there actually was no declaration filed by any of these non-debtor defendants, the individuals, regarding the so-called impact uh, on them uh, and whether they even intend to try to take a position uh, with respect to the lead plaintiff motions. Uh, uh, they have not weighed in at all. You would think, Your Honor, that if there's an allegation that uh, that they would drop everything uh, with respect to their responsibilities to the debtor and focus their entire attention on lead plaintiff motions where they actually have no standing uh, to weigh in at all, uh, it's uh, it, it's a bit beyond the pale. Uh, another observation that's important, Your Honor, uh, is uh, uh, the claims that are asserted in the class action. Uh, those claims are claims in connection with uh, the purchase or sale of a security. Uh, in this case, the BIAs are alleged to be securities uh, covered by the federal securities laws. And as I'm sure the court is aware, um, under Section 510B of the Code, uh, those types of claims are statutorily uh, subordinated. Uh, so uh, those claims uh, would not be entitled to a distribution under the plan, uh, the proposed plan. And I don't know that uh, uh, whether anyone has even filed a claim against the debtor in the bankruptcy proceeding. The debtors are obviously not parties to the class actions, those class actions um, were filed uh, after the petition date. Uh, so uh, uh, there's no impact on the debtors uh, with respect to the class actions altogether. Of course, that, uh, that doesn't that assume that we're dealing with securities? I mean, that's just not such a, a, a given, given the, the cases that have come down recently. No, no, no question, Your Honor. That's, that's an issue that the district court, uh, will have to wrestle with down the road. But, uh, in terms of what's before you today, uh, uh, if they're not securities, then there are no federal securities claims and, uh, and the class actions, uh, fail, uh, on the merits. So, excuse me. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's not, that's not a today issue. And if, if, if there is a resolution of that issue, uh, that the BIAs are not securities, then there are no federal securities claims. 
Uh, so uh, uh, that's uh, that's that's really the bottom line, and your observation is uh, is correct. Um, Your Honor, as I indicated, uh, there's a very limited purpose to our motion. Um, but uh, the debtors have put in front of you a parade of horribles that I'd like to uh, address briefly. I know they're addressed in the briefing, uh, but I think it's important to, uh, uh, to point uh, some of them out. Um, first of all, uh, even dating back to the debtors' opposition to the motion to shorten time. Uh, uh, the debtors, who again are not parties to the class action, and there are no claims certainly asserted by our client. We don't know whether there are any other claims uh, asserted based upon uh, the violations of the securities laws. But uh, the debtors take the position that uh, somehow uh, – the district courts deciding the lead plaintiff's motions uh, would force the debtors to participate in the class action lawsuits and forfeit their due process rights. Uh, now, those are lofty words, uh, Your Honor, but uh, there's no explanation as to the basis uh, for that kind of hyperbole. Uh, there simply is no impact on the debtor and uh, the debtor's due process rights are not put into play by virtue of this court granting the very limited relief that we're seeking. Um, second, they take the position back then and in their opposition that we're looking to solve a problem that doesn't exist with respect to representation of uh, putative class members. Uh, they claim that the creditors committee uh, is already representing uh, these class members with respect to uh, the claims asserted in the class action. Uh, well, the problem with that, Your Honor, it ignores the distinction between uh, the, the status of those individuals as holders of BIAs uh, and it, with respect to that status, uh, yes, they are general unsecured creditors and part of uh, the creditors committee's constituency. But with respect to uh, the subordinated claims that are asserted in the class action, which may or may not have even been asserted in the chapter 11 cases, and even if they were, they would not be entitled to any distribution uh, uh, by virtue of that subordination. Uh, the creditors committee doesn't represent their interests with respect to those claims. Uh, that would be uh, uh, an interest that would be represented by a court-appointed lead plaintiff. And we're just looking to get to that point where there is a court-appointed lead plaintiff uh, who has certain responsibilities and fiduciary obligations to individual class members, regardless of whether a class uh, has been certified or not, and uh, uh, is empowered to take certain positions with respect to the class, again, even, even in advance of uh, certification. Uh, and, Your Honor, what, what, what's looming now and why the motion was made is a confirmation objection deadline of September 11th and a confirmation hearing on uh, September 26th. And uh, uh, to the extent the class is and their claims in the class action are in need protection, and to the extent that a position needs to be taken, um, we believe it's critical uh, that uh, a lead plaintiff be appointed. Now, the, the debtors also harp on the fact that there's no guarantee that the district courts uh, will rule in time. Well, we get that. Uh, that's a risk. Uh, we don't know what the district courts are going to do uh, and what the orders are going to say and whether Mr. Wyatt will, in fact, be appointed uh, by the district court. 
But one thing is for certain. Uh, if the district court is precluded from even considering the motions um, and the relief that we're requesting is not granted, um, then there will be no uh, a court-appointed lead plaintiff uh, who's in a position uh, to take a position with respect to uh, the plan and confirmation, whatever that might be. Uh, simply put, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Wyatt or any lead plaintiff that's appointed would be handcuffed by virtue of not having the imprimatur of uh, an Article Three court uh, uh, in terms of uh, an order appointing him or some other individual uh, to assume the role of a lead plaintiff, uh, uh, order the appointment of uh, lead plaintiff's chosen counsel, and put them in a position uh, to act uh, in the bankruptcy proceeding. Well, let me ask you, Mr. Atkin, if I were to grant the relief to allow the process to go forward, is the logical next motion on shortened time going to be, Judge, the district court hasn't decided the motion for lead plaintiffs yet. We need to adjourn uh, the confirmation hearing and this process to allow the lead plaintiff uh, to to be appointed and to be be in a position to participate at the confirmation hearing. Is that uh, what's going to follow? Well, I, I I don't know, Your Honor. Uh, you know, thanks for pointing out an option to me with respect to this. But, but I doubt I needed to point that out. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I uh, to be frank with the court, I, I don't know that, 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 uh, uh, that that's something that we would entertain. I think the first thing that we would do if the court were to sign an order and hopefully sign it quickly, uh, allowing us to go forward is to advise the district courts, uh, that, uh, they can now just des- uh, decide, uh, the lead plaintiff motions and that, and point out the schedule with respect to confirmation and try to get them to, uh, uh, to issue an order quickly. Um, uh, Your Honor, I'm, uh, as, as you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the fast moving train of a confirmation process and, uh, 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 and the, the danger of trying to step in front of that train. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know that we would take that step. I think that our preference would be uh, to advise the district court quickly, advise the district court that that timing is an issue and important, and uh, and hopefully get a decision out of them um, uh, in advance of the uh, objection deadline. Uh, which is obviously why we moved on short notice in the first place, uh, and certainly advance of, in advance of the confirmation hearing. Um, and, uh, you know, to the extent that doesn't happen, uh, we would have to weigh our options. Fair enough. Uh, Your Honor, this is not an attempt, uh, to push the class actions forward to anyone's detriment. Uh, uh, they're, they're, there, there would be no merits determinations here. Um, uh, the individual defendants obviously don't care by virtue of the fact that they did not weigh in at all on the motion and that they did not even uh, execute a declaration with respect to the, the, the factual allegations in the debtor's uh, in, in the debtor's opposition. So the issue of um, whether uh, the individual defendant's uh, uh, hair will be put on fire by virtue of uh, a district court uh, uh, deciding a lead plaintiff motion, uh, I, I, I just don't think that there's any substance to that kind of argument. Um, now, the debtors also uh, argue uh, that... Uh, uh, like they previewed in their uh, objection to the motion to shorten time, that the same considerations that would support, excuse me, the same considerations 
that would support the injunction in the first place are at play with respect to the limited relief that we're uh, that we're requesting. Well, you know, leaving aside the merits of those arguments from Mr. Wyatt's perspective, uh, as well as the extent to which those arguments support uh, a preliminary injunction uh, regarding all other activity in the class actions, which is not the subject of our motion. Uh, uh, they certainly have nothing to do with what we're asking uh, the court to do. And let me just get into that, you know, briefly. Uh, Mr. Wyatt inherited the stipulated uh, injunction order. It's not a complaint, Your Honor. It's just a fact. Um, uh, and it, uh, it, it, it does contemplate that the district court, uh, and I'm talking about the stipulated order, it contemplates that the district court can enter certain unidentified orders, and it does not expressly prohibit the district court from uh, entering orders with respect to the lead plaintiff motion. But uh, here we are. We're not taking that position on, on the merits. We're in front of Your Honor asking for relief. Um, let's talk about uh, each of the three issues that the debtors raise. Uh, the collateral estoppel evidentiary prejudice. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm lost with respect to that one, Your Honor. I don't know uh, uh, what uh, the relief that we're requesting uh, would have to do with respect to any res judicata collateral estoppel evidentiary prejudice on a debtor that's not a defendant in the class action, where there are no claims against the debtor. And even if there were, those claims would be subordinated and not entitled to a distribution under the current version of the plan. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to know uh, where where that's coming from. Um, with respect to the uh, impact on the individual defendants who are still at the company and who are performing services for the company, um, again, I've, I've, I've raised this issue. The papers deal with the issue. Uh, uh, the idea that they're going to drop everything and focus their attention on uh, the district court deciding these lead plaintiff motions uh, just uh, makes no sense, and there's no evidentiary support for it. Uh, so, I, I, again, I don't know how that figures in as a uh, as a reason uh, for the court to deny uh, the limited relief that we're requesting. And uh, lastly, Your Honor, they focus on their indemnification obligations. A uh, couple of things to say about that. Uh, and we do uh, raise that in our reply. Um, uh, number one, uh, the indemnification with respect to a claim against these individuals that's based upon the purchase or sale of a security is likewise subordinated under 510B. Uh, so those indemnification claims, when you look at the code, uh, uh, clearly uh, would not be entitled to a distribution. Um, the debtors may point out, although they didn't in their papers, that uh, that the debtors assumed certain indemnification obligations under the terms of the plan. Um, well, uh, there's a carve-out with respect to those indemnification obligations, Your Honor, uh, as it relates to gross negligence, fraud, uh, uh, willful misconduct. Those are the claims that are asserted in the class action. So to the extent that, uh, uh, that the, uh, 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 that the class would be successful, um, with respect to, uh, the claims, um, those claims on their face, uh, would not, would be carved out of any indemnification obligations. Uh, and lastly, Your Honor, uh, with respect to the somewhat newly minted settlement with the committee, um, several of those key defendants have waived their indemnification claims uh, against the debtor in any event. Uh, 
um, under the terms of that settlement agreement. Uh, so, uh, in terms of indemnification, Your Honor, oh, and of course there is insurance, uh, with respect to those claims as well. Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of, 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 of those, uh, arguments, Your Honor, uh, there's really, there's really no substance to them, certainly as they relate to the relief, uh, that we're requesting, uh, in connection with the motion. Um, the, the debtors also raise in their opposition that the selection of lead plaintiff is complex and time-consuming. Well, I, 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 I've had the opportunity over the years to be involved in that process where there's an intervening bankruptcy. And uh, uh, I, I, I haven't seen that. It's a competitive process. It may be complex as between those vying for the role, uh, with respect to lead plaintiff motions. Um, but there's nothing before the court, uh, that, uh, uh, supports the, uh, conclusory allegation, uh, that, uh, that the process is complex and time consuming. And frankly, Your Honor, if, if, it, if the district court believes that, uh, they'll act accordingly. Uh, but, uh, uh, they need to be given the opportunity to make a decision, uh, on that. In the first instance, and uh, and that's why we're here. Um, finally, Your Honor, uh, the debtors take the position that well, uh, by virtue of the terms of the stipulated injunction, uh, once the plan goes effective, you can do whatever you want. So, no bit, no big deal. Uh, you know, the problem is that there are issues that the plan creates vis-a-vis -vis third party releases, uh, an issue that this court and many courts have been wrestling with for quite some time. And, uh, at the end of the day, if, uh, uh, if, if the plan is confirmed without the participation of a court appointed fiduciary on behalf of class, of class members, um, 30 days after the effective date will, will come, and those claims uh, that are the subject of the class action uh, could be wiped out or severely eviscerated uh, under the terms of the plan. So, um, you know, while we appreciate the injunction uh, is automatically terminated at that point in time, uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that, that's going to be much too late. Uh, with respect to that issue, as well as other issues uh, that may exist under the plan uh, that may require some involvement by uh, a court-appointed lead plaintiff. Uh, so, uh, Your Honor, uh, uh, the idea that there's no harm in waiting until then uh, really, uh, you know, doesn't provide um, what's required and avoid the prejudice that would happen uh, without uh, an appointment by the district court. Uh, so with that, Your Honor, we would urge the court uh, to uh, grant the motion uh, and allow us the opportunity to advise the district court uh, that they're free to make a decision and uh, hopefully they will make it quickly and uh, and uh, whoever the court appointed lead plaintiff and their uh, and and their counsel are uh, would have the opportunity uh, to weigh in with respect to the confirmation process. All right, thank you, Mr. Rekin. Uh Let me turn to Ms. Uh, Furness. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Etkin. The loss is over. One significant issue here. There are two cases. We have the Green Matter and the Ellis Matter. One is in New Jersey. One is in Massachusetts. Mr. Edkin didn't address it today. They didn't address it on their reply. But consolidation and whether there are two cases that go forward at the exact same time in two different courts based on more or less the same actions has to be decided first. 
The PSLRA says that, quote, if any party has sought to consolidate those actions for pretrial purposes or for trial, that has to be heard before the lead plaintiff process. First, sometimes Mr. Atkin used district court, sometimes he used district court. Um, we believe that this entire issue was ignored simply because it goes back to the original issues that we brought before this court in April of this year. The defendants in the class action, purported class action, have every right to participate and weigh in on that consolidation. The PSLRA says any party, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure allows any party to address consolidation. That must be heard first. To the extent it hasn't been filed, it's because this court stipulation allowed the lead plaintiff motions to be filed and said nothing else. That's where we are. That's where it stopped. So the idea that there's absolutely no harm here and the harm that we identified in April has gone away now is absurd and without basis. The same concerns that we presented previously, one, for indemnification, and two, for divided times of our officers and directors, still exist today. As far as evidentiary um, substance on that, we presented that with the original TRO application, Your Honor. You've got it in the file. Um, if they have to turn their attention to matters such as these, again, in which defendants have the absolute right to participate, they won't be focused on the debtors during this incredibly crucial time. We have less than a month uh, prior to uh, the uh, confirmation of the plan. Mr. Etkin talked a lot about the indemnification provision and why that doesn't matter as it relates um, to the debtor's concern with this moving forward. But, Your Honor, I, uh, you know this. Mr. White's counsel seems to have ignored it. The plan hasn't been confirmed. Right. So to the extent anyone in the officers and directors have waived their right to indemnification in the plan, that's not confirmed yet. And until that is, it is a concern for the debtors. And we are entitled to have the full focus of our officers um, and directors. As far as what the debtors can do on the lead plaintiff, or excuse me, as far as what the defendants can do on the lead plaintiff process, in each of the two district courts, again, that we're talking about, it's not necessary that this court make a decision related to that. Instead, we presented the court with cases that clearly say defendants can and do participate in both the lead plaintiff process, whether the uh, plaintiff is adequate, and the lead counsel process. Whether these district courts, again, two of them, in both New Jersey and Massachusetts actually um, take the arguments of those defendants or not is not before this court. They can participate. Whether the participation leads the court to review those things or not, again, it is that participation that deprives the debtors of their officers and directors' time during a very, very crucial moment in these bankruptcy cases. Mr. Wyatt and the proposed class have demonstrated absolutely no irreparable harm here. It is their duty to come here with good cause. There's no evidentiary basis. You heard Mr. Atkin argue that repeatedly as far as the debtors, but again, we presented the evidentiary basis, which is before this court, when we came to argue for the TRO and we got the stipulation agreed to by uh, Mr. Green's counsel, Mr. Ellis' counsel. There's been absolutely nothing presented, no, de no declaration or anything on behalf of Mr. Wyatt or this pur purported lead plaintiff. There's nothing to show irreparable harm. And again, going back, and I'm, Your Honor, I'm, I'm confident you've read our, our briefing, but there is no standing in this bankruptcy for purported class counsel, purported plaintiffs, uh, in a class action against non-debtors. Uh, we've presented you, Your Honor, with a Dynegy case. There's another case out of the Eastern District of Virginia that goes through the exact same analysis. Um, 
somebody as a lead plaintiff in a securities litigation does not provide any authorization for them to come into the bankruptcy cases. It doesn't provide them any status to come into the bankruptcy cases. Being a lead plaintiff in one type of litigation is not, quote, tantamount to a blanket consent to any litigation that class counsel may wish to pursue. Um, so there's, they've admitted they have no claims here. There's no place here for someone who has been designated as lead plaintiff solely in a one of two uh, district courts related to a PSLRA action to come to this court without further authorization, further moving, asking for this court to clarify or to classify a class, certify a class. Um, there's just absolutely no basis. So again, because there's no basis, there's no irreparable harm that they've shown or can show in this case, especially considering, again, we're in the last month before confirmation and the stipulation by its own terms expires 30 days after confirmation of the plan. As far as Mr. Atkins' argument that certain um, of these uh, purported class members have, um, you know, a, a basis to object to confirmation, they can. They're more than welcome to. Mr. Wyatt clearly has counsel, um, and each one of them can come to this court and object to the confirmation uh, in whatever way they feel. It's just not appropriate here for a class action. In addition, Mr. Atkins said that these folks have claims that, quote, could be wiped out or eviscerated. That's simply not true, Your Honor. The plan includes an opt-out. These folks received the disclosure statement that discusses and explains the opt-out provision of those releases. Um, so if the individuals want to opt out, they can. It's possible. <clears throat> Mr. Wyatt has counsel. He can do it. I also point the court, again, to the delay that um, Mr. Wyatt has shown. In April, the, the stipulation was entered into by Green Council's, Green's Council and Ellis' Council. The lead plaintiff motions were filed in May, and these folks waited three months, three months to come to this court to ask for something else to go forward. They asked for it on an emergent basis simply one month before confirmation. Again, Your Honor, this is their burden. They have presented no evidence to you. There is no irreparable harm here. These individuals have the same rights that they have with or without Mr. Wyatt being appointed as class counsel. And at the end of the day, this harms the debtors because our officers and directors' uh, attention will be focused on other matters at a time when we really need to have their attention focused here as we move uh, towards confirmation in less than a month. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Furness. Uh, Mr. Calandra, I see your hand raised first. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to, as the um, uh, purported lead count or proposed lead counsel in the class actions, I just wanted to speak to the issues about um, consolidation that were just raised, which really are meritless. Um, it's the same movements in both New Jersey and Massachusetts with the same certifications. So the same lead plaintiff is going to be selected in each. The one with the greatest losses, which we submit, is Mr. Wyatt. Um, and there will be nothing uh, having to do with consolidation that goes forward under the terms of the relief that we're looking for. And um, it was a nice bit of three-card Monty that counsel was trying to play with the nature of how Consolidation must be uh, must be addressed under the PSLRA, but there is nothing in the PSLRA that says consolidation must happen before a lead plaintiff is selected. Um, it's just that if uh, a party wants consolidation, they need to move for it. And I can represent that none of the uh, filers, who again are all the same in both uh, both actions, are going to be seeking consolidation uh, under the very limited relief that we are seeking. Um, uh, uh, counsel for the debtors also brought up the cases uh, purporting to allow um, 
uh, people like the, or uh, people like defendants in the current cases to weigh in on the lead plaintiff motion. As you saw in our papers, Your Honor, those cases are simply not, they're number one, a minority of cases. Number two, are not relevant here. There is nothing wrong with notice. There is nothing wrong with the certifications. Um, and there certainly is no issue regarding loss causation. In the case against Twitter, uh, the defendants pointed out that the proposed lead plaintiffs, the movements, could not have experienced any losses because they sold before the corrective disclosure. Here, everyone held through the corrective disclosure, which was blocked by his decision to file for bankruptcy. So there is absolutely no role they have to play. And I would suggest if they do try to play a role, um, it, it would be a, it would be specious because they just, there is just nothing that they can do. And finally, Your Honor, I wanted to say that um, the debtors uh, emphasize again and again that they don't want their officers and directors to be distracted. Their officers and directors are seeking to release these claims. They are focused, at least in part, on their own personal matters in this bankruptcy, and allowing this very small step to go forward would require absolutely no further attention on their part, and certainly no greater distraction or focus on themselves that they've already expressed. Thank you, Mr. Calandra. Mr. Gold, your hand is raised. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Dan Gold from Sherman and Sterling. I represent the individual individual defendants in this uh, securities class actions. Uh, did, did, uh, thank you for letting us be heard. Uh, we did not file a formal objection uh, simply because the debtors are covering the issues. Uh, and duplicative paper uh, did not seem to benefit the court and just a waste of attorney's fees. Um, we want to address, we do have a role to play in the lead plaintiff process. Um, where there are issues, it is appropriate for us to weigh in. And in particular, uh, the consolidation issue is, is a key one. We do have the two cases. Uh, the lead plaintiffs may not intend to, or the plaintiff movements may not intend to move for consolidation. That doesn't mean the defendants do not intend to do so at the appropriate time. Uh, we, we, what we can't have are two different lead plaintiffs appointed on behalf of the same class in two different courts. There needs to be a degree of coordination and consolidation between the two courts. Uh, the defendants have an interest and a role, an important role to play, in making sure that that happens. And what I'm hearing from, from at least one lead plaintiff movement is that uh, we are now going to be forced to uh, engage with six or seven individual clients uh, to move on an expedited basis to uh, get that coordination and consolidation among the courts, um, taking away from uh, the role that the individuals have to play with, with the debtors. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Mr. Calandra again. Your Honor, that's just simply not true. Um, if they want to move for consolidation in their papers, they suggested that they would resist any consolidation motion. Uh, but the... There is nothing that defendants need to do with regard to a lead plaintiff motion in this case because they could only object to perhaps loss causation, certification, and notice, and none of those. They don't suggest that they are an issue because they are not. And there won't be any need to wrangle multiple people under the relief, the very narrow relief that we are seeking. It will be the same lead plaintiff ordered in both cases, and they will be dealing with exactly one lead plaintiff, hopefully me. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. And finally, Ms. Furness. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Briefly, Mr. Calandra seems awfully confident in what I think are opinions of what a court may or may not do. Um, while he thinks that no matter what uh, arguments Mr. Gold's clients have, they will fail, that's not for this court to decide. Mr. Calandra and Mr. Atkin have, you know, come to the court and said, well, debtors didn't present anything that shows the notice were wrong, that or this is not an adequate plan. If it's not the debtor's job, the debtors aren't a defendant in that case. Um, we're not required to do that. The point is, Your Honor, Mr. Calandra cannot absolutely say that. He can't guarantee that the court won't allow the, de the defendant to do something. In addition, you also have not heard, and which we do believe is significant that you pointed out, they have not committed to this being it. 
This is not it, Your Honor. Simply doing this is not going to be the end of this. The reason they've asked for it, the reason they think they have irreparable harm is that they can come in again with a month prior to confirmation to ask this court for further things, for example, a delay of the, the, um, the confirmation hearing. And again, Your Honor, there is no irreparable harm. Each of these individuals in this purported class can do what they want to do to protect themselves. The disclosure statement allows um, gives everyone the information. The plan allows an opt-out for the releases. There's no irreparable harm here, and, Your Honor, we would just respectfully request that you deny the release uh, requested by Mr. Wyatt. All right. Thank you all. Your Honor, can I make one last point? And I, I apologize for the free-for-all, uh, but um, uh, uh, Ms. Furness keeps talking about irreparable harm. Um, I think the standard is good cause. Uh, and uh, uh, injecting an irreparable harm standard into this uh, is uh, uh, just not correct. Um, we, we believe the good cause is, 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 is obvious given the timing. Um, we've set it out. If the individual defendants wanted to weigh in about consolidation, they should have filed papers. They didn't. If they want the cases consolidated, they can come in and file a motion tomorrow uh, for limited relief from the injunction. Uh, that's up to them. Uh, but as Mr. Calandra pointed out, uh, consolidation is not uh, is not the issue before the court, and none of us. Uh, can presuppose what the district court will say or do with respect to the lead plaintiff motions. Uh, this is all about giving the district courts uh, the opportunity uh, to weigh in. Uh, and what they do, what they say, what orders they enter, and when they, what orders they enter, and when they enter them, uh, you know, that's going to be up to them, and, uh, and we'll have to deal with the consequences of that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rifkin. Uh, well argued. Uh, I appreciate the movement's transparency and candor in coming to the court. Uh, it's clear uh, the purposes that would be served by the court uh, modifying the stipulated injunction uh, and order that's already in place. And I agree with Mr. Ekin, the standard is cause. Is there cause to do so? Where I disagree is that I don't find cause. I don't find any change in circumstances from when Mr. Trey Green and Mr. Anthony Ellis, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, stipulated and agreed that for an essentially an exchange, the opportunity to file the motions in advance of a deadline to do so, and how important that was, and the acknowledgement that their efforts cannot and should not impair the efforts of this debtor to reorganize. Those efforts included a hotly uh, contested uh, mediation, several hotly contested mediation settlement, settlements uh, proceedings in front of mediators, also uh, in which the court took part in, uh, which has not been completed because there has been no confirmation of any plan yet. Uh, the agreement that Mr. Green and Mr. Ellis acknowledged in, through their stipulation was to allow the process to go forward, not to restrain or handcuff the necessary participants uh, so that it would impair, uh, and the insiders, uh, that it would impair the reorganization. Uh, and we are on the cusp of a plan. I don't know if the plan's been going to be confirmed. I don't know what the voting is going to be. But we are on the cusp of having that. I believe it's scheduled for September 26th. Certainly, the prospects of a plan that would impact the claims of Mr. Green and Mr. Ellis were contemplated when the, when the stipulation was agreed to. 
there is no prejudice to either those defendants in this adversary or the plaintiffs or Mr. Wyatt in participating further in the Chapter 11 process without a court-appointed fiduciary on their behalf. Indeed, that's where I disagree to the language that's been in the brief that class members should have a court-appointed fiduciary for purposes of this Chapter 11. These individuals, these class members, these proposed lead plaintiffs have counsel, and even without counsel, they have the ability to represent their interests and take issue with any aspects of the proposed plan that impacts, impairs their rights. Indeed, and all counsel knows, that there are opportunities apart from having a court-designated fiduciary as part of the class. Creditors often form ad hoc committees and retain counsel to get themselves involved in the case. And there's no surprise that we're at confirmation. That was contemplated in the three months between the time the stipulation was entered, that that was the opportunity. I don't find cause. I understand that Mr. Ellis and Mr. Green may consent to the motion to modify the stipulated injunction, but that would operate as a backdoor for them to agree and allow another party to come in to get more relief than they requested in the stipulation. And again, I see no prejudice. It's not an issue of irreparable harm, but the plan is an opt-out plan. But more importantly, these plaintiffs in the class action have an opportunity to engage with this court with respect to the merits of the plan, and the process in the class action can proceed along the lines of the stipulated injunction. What I will do to make sure, because we don't know what happens on September 26th, if there are other delays, and I would agree that the class actions can't be delayed interminably. The debtor is supposed to have an opportunity to confirm a plan. They have that opportunity on September 26th, so I will carry the motion to September 26th. And to see if it looks like the plan process is being retarded, if there aren't votes, or if there are certainly questions as to whether there is a viable plan, then I think the court should take another look at letting these plaintiffs proceed in either of the courts or where the class actions are pending. But the agreement in effect, and in the court's view, the proper basis to enter the stipulated injunction haven't changed, and the circumstances haven't changed. And the potential impact and the potential impairment of the ability to pursue a reorganization and the mechanics involved in reorganizing warrant denying, well, not granting the relief today, but simply carrying the motion to September 26th. So I'm not going to enter an order unless plaintiffs wish, well, it's movements wish for me to enter an order denying it. My inclination is to simply carry the matter to September 26th. Mr. Rankin, do you prefer a denial? I'm trying to save you time to having to refile in case the circumstances change. Well, I understand, Your Honor, and we appreciate that, and we'll live with carrying the motion to the 26th. All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. You're welcome to stay on for another interesting argument, or you may be excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Your Honor.